백일도 박사님과 함께 교실 안에서의 창의성에 관하여 인터뷰하겠습니다. 로날드 베게토 박사님은 현재 미국 코네티컷 주립대학교 교육심리학과 부교수이시고요. 11년 동안 오레곤 주립대학에서 부교수와 교육학과 부학장으로 일하셨습니다. 어, 현재 시, 미국 심리학회 회원이시고 학술지 The Journal of Creative Behavior 최고 편집자이십니다. 안녕하세요. Hello. Congratulations on your recent Korean release of your book. Thank you. This book is Nurturing Creativity in the Classroom. 한국말로 교실에서의 창의성 교육인데요. So could you explain what this book is sure. about? So this book is a project that goes back several years ago. Um, Dr. James Kaufman and I, who are collaborators, wanted to bring together experts in creativity, but also experts in education, which is kind of where our expertise meets as well. So he has expertise in creativity, um, and my expertise in creativity focuses on education. And so what we wanted to do is explore the kind of question of how can teachers support creativity while at the same time fulfilling their responsibilities to teach academic learning. And so this is often a tension that many teachers end up facing is if I promote creativity will it come at the cost of student learning. If I focus on student learning will it come at the cost of supporting student creativity. So we assembled a group of experts, um, international experts, to contribute essays to that book and explore that question and provide their suggestions, experiences, and recommendations. Okay, then let's get started with the basics. All right, good. So, what is a creativity? So, we have a <laughs> guest. Her name is Mini Kitty, and she is a sixth grader student. And can you explain to Mini Kitty what creativity is? Yes, should we have him <laughs> explain to her? <laughs> All right. Um, so, I would say creativity, Mini Kitty, is anything that is new and meaningful. And so that is a definition that also adds the, the little piece of as defined in a particular situation. So for you, Mini Kitty, it could be any idea that you have is, that is new and personally meaningful to you would be considered creative. Uh, we call that Mini C creativity. So that fits with Mini Kitty. So Mini C creativity. Um, but then if we want creativity to be recognized by others, it usually has to fit um, the task of the particular environment. So if I'm making uh, something with leftovers in my refrigerator, and I think it would be a creative combination to combine um, leftover sushi rolls with um, the spaghetti I made last night somehow, really? and I think, I think that might be tasty um, and new, so that by <laughs> definition is creative in my mind, mini C creativity, and I serve that to my family and they think it's horrible because it's um, too salty or something, then it would not be considered creative to them. So sometimes things can be creative for us, but not to others. So in order to kind of rise from mini C creativity to little C creativity, what we need to have happen is feedback. So I would ask my family, like my daughter and my wife, what can I do to make this better? Maybe they say, oh, maybe add some acid to it, like a little bit of uh, lemon juice might actually balance out the saltiness, for example, or add some sugar, and maybe that could blend the saltiness. And so with their feedback, maybe I could turn that into something that's tasty, and at that level would be little c creativity. So it's everyday creativity. Would a famous chef say my combination is creative? Probably not. But in that context, it would be creative. Now, if we want to go to the even next level, what James Kaufman and I call pro-C creativity, that usually takes many years of expertise. So the professional chef is somebody who spent many years combining different flavors in new and meaningful and tasty ways in that context. And then even beyond that are legendary creators who are like um, people who have changed the entire profession of cooking or being a chef. And those, that's usually out of the hands of the individual creator. That's something that, you know, writers and critics and chefs, um, usually after the person is dead, say, this person was a legendary cook. Um, do Does that you help? understand, <laughs> Mini Kitty? <laughs> Can you be a little bit shorter? The very short version of what is creativity is anything that is new and meaningful. So that could mean in your own personal experience, if you have a new idea um, and you feel like it makes sense to you and it's good, that's creativity. If it's um, recognized by other people and it fulfills a particular task, then that's creative. And that can range from things we experience all the way to legendary creators. 
Do you understand? Goodbye, Minnie Kitty. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, I just learned uh, the definition of a creativity, mm -hmm. and according to your definition of a creativity, it seems that content knowledge is as important as exploration in fostering creativity. Absolutely. So what content knowledge provides is the task appropriateness. It provides the context, if you will, for being creative. So one of the problems I have is with sayings like think outside of the box. Often we need to think creatively inside the box. And sometimes we need to think when it's time to build a new box. And in order to really make a creative contribution that has a big impact, you need to have expertise in a particular domain or content area. So in the schools, for example, subject matter provides that context, like mathematics. So how can we be creative in our mathematical teaching and our, and our learning of mathematics? So I would say it's both necessary for generating new ideas, but it also serves as a context for making sure that our originality is task appropriate. I see. The United States educational policy uh, seems to be going towards a standard-based curriculum with rigorous content knowledge. Also, many Asian countries are famous for rigorous content based in high standard curriculum. So I think many teachers all over the world have same situation. Yeah. They have to teach some knowledge. Right. At the same time, they should nurture creativity. Right. So what can a teacher do to foster creativity within a full rigorous yeah. curriculum? That's a good question. And so I think a lot of teachers sometimes feel like the more standards there are, the more content there is, the less room there is for creativity. But in actuality, when we think about creativity in an educational context, what you have when you have content standards and you have content to teach, you're halfway there to creativity. So one of the ways that we represent creativity and others have represented creativity is creativity would be like C equals originality times task appropriateness in a particular context. So the task appropriateness is like learning how to write a haiku, for example. Okay. That's something teachers teach. So what we want to add to that is the originality. So have kids write their own original haikus in the context of a high school classroom. So now you have creativity happening, which is really a multiplicative combination of originality and task appropriateness. If you only have originality, but you don't have content, you just have originality. It's mm -hmm. maybe nonsensical, mm -hmm. so it's not creative. If you only have task appropriateness, which is what we often have in school, but no originality, mm -hmm. then we don't have creativity. So really, teachers are already halfway there in the mm -hmm. equation. All they need to do is add originality, have students and themselves put their own original spin on the content, and then they can have creativity in the context of their classroom. Could you be a little bit more specific? Like example? For example, all right, yeah. so let's take something like would seem where maybe creativity is not possible at all. So teaching students how to solve a math story problem. So you give them a story problem and there is one correct answer for sure. Um, so a kid who writes popcorn as the answer, that's not <laughs> creative and it's not accurate. Okay, so let's say the answer is 18. Well, there's many ways to get at that answer. So that's where the originality could be introduced. So creative teachers would say, okay, they might teach how to solve such problems, and then what they would ask their students to do is say, come up with as many new ways of solving this as possible, as you can. Mm -hmm. And when teachers do this, students can generate 12, 13, 15, 20 different ways of solving one problem. That's the originality. It's also mathematically accurate, and so that's creativity. Right? So that's how you in infuse creativity into something that seems th not welcoming, even like mathematics. So we've talked about teachers in classroom, mm -hmm. but really a student, first the classroom can be their living room or kitchen sure. or their bedroom with their parents. So you're a father and you are a creativity researcher. So I assume that you might have secret methods <laughs> or recipes to ensure your ch child's creativity. I think, yeah, as a parent or as a teacher or coach, I think you, we all have opportunities to support creativity. And I don't think there's any secret to it. I think it's just reminding ourselves of a couple things. One is to explore students and our own children's ideas first. So when students say things that are unusual, 
oftentimes our first response is to evaluate it, incorrect or correct. What if we just take a moment and say, help me understand what you're saying, I don't understand, okay? When you do that, first you show that you respect the student's idea or the child's idea, and it gives them an opportunity to articulate it in a way that might be more clear. So maybe I'll give you an example if mm-hmm. that would help. So imagine a second grade student um, who has the problem 26 mm-hmm. minus 17, okay? Mm-hmm. Which equals nine, mm-hmm. correct? No. Is that correct? 26 minus 17 equals nine, yes, oh. okay. <laughs> So you ask the child, maybe you're helping the kid with homework, this is your own child, or you're a teacher, and you say, how did you get nine? This is an example I use a lot. Mm -hmm. And the child says, "Uh, I added three back to six and got nine. Mm -hmm. That's a very unusual response. Mm -hmm. You know, yes, three plus six is nine, but the problem is 26 minus 17, so I don't understand. So many teachers and parents would say, that's incorrect. No, 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 no. Mm -hmm. You need to borrow care okay Mm -hmm. what if you say where's the three come from Mm -hmm. so you give the child a chance and the child says okay i have 26 minus 17. i take the six and the seven i put it over here Mm -hmm. i have 20 minus 10 which is 10. i have my six and seven over here i subtract the seven from 10 that gives me three i add it back to six that equals nine that is mathematically correct, mm-hmm. and it's a very original way. That's a creative way of solving that problem. Mm-hmm. So part of it is helping the kid have a chance to explain their thinking and then providing feedback to either help them realize when something like that is appropriate, the context, or not, right? Yeah. And so I think in that case, we can l- all learn, wow, that's a very creative response, and other kids can maybe learn from that response, and it's a very appropriate response. In other cases, if a child did 26 minus 17 equals, um, you know, pizza, <laughs> then we might say, or maybe they write a poem about mathematics. Mm-hmm. We might say, okay, this poem is very original and beautiful, but this is not the appropriate context to write a poem about mathematics. You mm-hmm. need to solve the problem. So part about teaching students to be creative, and something James Kaufman and I talk about, is teaching them when to be creative and when not to be creative. Mm-hmm. Um, when there are costs involved in being creative and to understand those costs and when it's worth taking the risk and when it's not. And typically we see students who say things that are always very original, so help them shift and be more task appropriate. So how does this fit with the problem? Or kids who are never showing originality, pushing them to be more original. Can you come up with your own way of doing this? So it seems like to nurture creativity, parents should have lots of time to let their kids explore their originality. So what if Parents who have to work all day yeah. long. Yeah, I don't think it takes that much time. I think creativity often emerges in what I call micro moments, unexpected moments. It could be in the car. It could be walking the child to school. You only need a few moments, and you can always revisit those moments with children. So I think creativity can happen in um, a split second, right? Only a few moments. It only takes a moment to, instead of say, no, that's not correct, to say, how did you get three? and the child explains it. It takes only a few more moments. It doesn't take a lot of time. I think what it takes is being aware and being present in the moment Mm -hmm. to hear what your child's saying and to provide balance. I think creativity Mm -hmm. requires balance. So Mm -hmm. give children a chance to explore, but that exploration should be structured. It has to, at some point, connect to something meaningful. So kids who are very original, helping them connect it to something so that it makes sense and is original and other people can understand it, I think it's valuable. Sometimes originality for originality's sake is valuable too, but if we're talking about creativity, helping those kids who are really original connect it or make it clear, or helping those kids who don't show their originality, pushing them to be more original, to say, come up with your own way. How might you do this? So playing little games with them. So maybe you read, maybe your child has read a story and they have to take an exam on the story. Maybe you can say, after they've told you what the story's about, you could say, what if we took one of the characters out of the story? How would the story change? What if you wrote a new ending for the story? What would it be? That only takes a few moments. You can do it on the bus ride to school, whenever. And who's going to judge this is the right time and right place? Yeah, yeah. 
I think the environment has um, rules in place. Um, so I'll give you another example. My daughter, when she was in preschool, um, she had flatulence <laughs> okay, in preschool. So one of the rules in preschool is no potty talk. They couldn't talk about potty talk. Okay. So my daughter says, excuse me, I just had a poop bubble. Okay, that's a very creative way of describing flatulence, for sure. <laughs> but she, the teacher said, no potty talk. Okay, so my daughter tells me when I pick her up, I got in trouble today. I said, oh, what happened? She said, I tooted, but I called it a poop bubble. I laughed because <laughs> I thought it was funny. And I'm like, that's a very creative way of saying it. She said, how come you think this is funny and okay? And my teacher was upset. Mm. So we had the conversation. In preschool, there's a rule, no potty talk. So in that classroom, it's not okay to say poop bubble. Mm -hmm. Outside with me talking, it's okay. And it is creative. It's creative here, but not there. You know, we use a technical concept, creative metacognition, but really it's about there are certain places that are going to reward and mm -hmm. certain places that are going to punish creative expression. And so being able to read the environment and decide, is it worth it to mm -hmm. do this here or not? In some cases, you might say the punishment or risks are worth it. The benefits are greater, so I'm going to do it. So that's when you want to maybe restructure something. But for children, usually it's about learning how to live in those constraints and be creative within those constraints. Many Korean parents have their own box. Mm -hmm. For example, my parents didn't want me to be a musician. If a student wants to be a musician, then what should a student do? Yeah, so those are tensions. I mean, I think those are those are very difficult decisions that individuals and families make. Um, and. I think in some cases, somebody who's pursuing a creative aspiration, right, and are very passionate about it, there are great risks in fulfilling that aspiration. It might um, make for people who are upset with you, family members, maybe never talk again. Who knows? So there are costs involved in doing that. So for example, when I went to um, graduate school, it changed the way I interact with my family because I was one of the first to ever get a, a doctorate. Um, and you know, my parents didn't go to college. So it, you know, there's loss with learning as well. There's loss with creativity as well. There are costs involved with creativity. So I think part of it is helping um, young people understand that if you pursue your goal to become a musician, there may be some very real and painful costs involved. Okay, if you still decide to pursue that, then you likely need some sort of creative advocates or supports that will support your journey, mm. right? Um, to give you a very uh, another personal example, when I just started as a professor, um, one of my um, department heads at another university told me creativity is dead in education. It's dead. It's over. You need to find a more mainstream topic to study. Ba and said, essentially, if you want to get tenure as a professor, mm -hmm. you should probably study something other than creativity because it's dead. Right? And so I was like, oh my gosh, that's what I was passionate about. So I went to a conference and there was an established creativity researcher there. And I was talking to a small group of people and I said, my department head says, I, can't, I shouldn't study creativity, it's dead. And the established creativity researcher, um, Jane Pierdo, that's her name, leaned over and said, if you believe that, you're dead. You need to stop wringing your hands and put them to work pursuing your creative aspiration. I needed to hear that at that moment. It was kind of serendipitous, but that was kind of a creative advocate. And, you know, her voice carried me through those kind of dark and difficult times until later on, you know, once I started publishing, then that department had became very supportive and would share articles. Here's something about creativity. I know. So, I mean, it can happen, right? Mm -hmm. But I think there are costs involved and they can be very high costs. So I think being where creativity isn't always just about, you know, rainbows and unicorns and happiness. I mean, there's, there's dark nights of the soul, right? And mm -hmm. it can be painful and there can be lots of costs associated with it. And so if you're going to do that in spite of those costs, I think you having support to do it is critical, mm -hmm. critical to help out. Mm -hmm. You probably traveled lots of countries and you've seen some different unique situations mm -hmm. of each country. Is there any 
differences between the Western educational system and the Eastern yeah. educational system? So, I mean, clearly there are social, cultural, historical factors that influence education in every country. And even within countries, there's variations. So mm -hmm. I think it's important to recognize that. So, right. you know, no country has a monolithic mm -hmm. education. I mean, so there's different variations. That said, I think a lot of teachers and educators are still struggling with the same issues, kind of like we talked about at the very beginning, mm -hmm. feeling this tension between valuing creativity, valuing subject matter, worrying that creativity is being taken away. Mm -hmm. uh, and when I went to the WISE conference in uh, 2014, just this past fall, um, so it's the World Innovation Summit on Education. So there are, there are delegates from all over the world there. Mm -hmm. And they took an informal poll and they basically asked, how many of you feel schools kill creativity? So 65% thought mm -hmm. schools kill creativity. Okay, I find that very problematic. Mm -hmm. um, can schools suppress creativity? Yes. But the thing about creativity is it's part of our human nature, all of us. And so unless schools are killing people, <laughs> right, then they're not killing. I mean, as long as there's life, there's creativity. So I think that's a bit of an exaggeration. And what I worry about is mm -hmm. if people value something like creativity and worry it's being taken away, then it can lead to creativity mandates. For example, saying things like, you must use this technique to increase student creativity. And I don't think creativity can thrive in a situation like that. So what I would like to see is helping teachers in whatever specific cultural context they're working in, honoring the historical and cultural traditions of that context, still finding ways to make slight changes to their practices to bring in originality and creativity without worrying about trying to take some strategy that works over here or over there and trying to assume and force fit it right here. I see. So I think that's highly problematic, but I think it could happen if people are feeling, you know, that's a very powerful motivator to feel like I value this and it's being taken away, I want to do something. I think that can lead to uh, poor decision making on mm -hmm. the part of policymakers. So I think helping teachers do what they're already doing a little bit better and more creatively mm -hmm. is a much more viable approach and it respects the particular context mm -hmm. rather than try to drop things in from different places. So I'm seeing that same tension mm -hmm. happening. So your instructions or your books cannot be applied to Korean context? Absolutely, yes. I always say I'm not the kind of doctor that could or should be giving prescriptions. <laughs> <laughs> so I provide suggestions and my suggestion is always what are you already doing? What kinds of adjustments can you make to you, what you're already doing so that the practices are tailor-made not ready-made? They're the expert in their particular context. I raise the questions and provide examples of how you can infuse originality and creativity in what you're already doing. So, yes, it's suggestions that are meant to be implemented in a particular context where I would not say, this is what you must do, it's what you could do. Do you think creativity can be killed? I do believe our willingness mm -hmm. to pursue a creative aspiration can die. Mm -hmm. And maybe not die forever, mm -hmm. but at least go on more time. So, for example, somebody who wants to be a musician, mm -hmm. right? They're pursuing their dream being a musician. They have one negative performance outcome. Or maybe they get feedback from another musician or a parent or a teacher or whatever. And after that, they set down their guitar and never pick it up again. Right? That happens a lot. Um, why does that happen? And it doesn't happen to everybody. That same feedback, same situation can happen to somebody and they're more motivated to keep playing. Why? So that's the phenomenon I want to explore. What seems to be the case in, in the situation of the people that put the guitar down and never pick it up again, or hang up the dance shoes, or put down the poetry pen, or hang up their lab coat in science and don't pursue it, is that they experience shame in that moment. So it's so painful to revisit picking up the guitar because shame is such an intense kind of emotion and it's a negative self-evaluation emotion. Shame plus the belief that they can't get better. I'm never going to get better. So those two things are so powerful that it becomes too painful and you feel like it's an exercise in futility to try to pursue that. Versus people who are motivated by such experiences, they might feel anger, they might even feel hurt by that, but they believe they can get better and they usually want to prove 
themselves or people wrong and say, I'll show you that I can be the next American Idol or whatever it is, mm-hmm. right? So um, that seems to be a key factor. And so what role do parents and teachers and coaches play? in how they deliver the feedback, in how they help students experience that negative performance outcome. So don't sugarcoat it. Be honest and say, yes, you're not ready, but here's how you can get better. Will you become a famous musician? I don't know. Who knows? But if you want to get better from where you are right now, this is what you're going to need to do because you're not there yet. So it's about honest feedback that also communicates the message that improvement is possible to help ease that so it's not a shameful moment um, but a temporary hurt that they can get get over and get better. Okay. If one day your child came home from school and you could sense with your superhuman PhD <laughs> mind that her creativity was being suffocated, then is there any CPR like <laughs> like reviving method? Yeah. Uh, you know, I don't think anybody needs a superhuman PhD sense to do that. I mean, kids will tell you. I mean, my daughter's told me that. It's, she's experiencing it right now. So I think that it's very delicate, and I think part of it is trying to show examples of how certain contexts that are going to be more supportive of creativity, certain contexts that are not, how you can still be creative in certain contexts that are not that supportive, and when it's worth it and when it's not. Trying to provide as many examples and I think most importantly, not just talk about it, but if you can find examples that the kid can relate to, right, I think that can be really powerful. I think some of the most powerful motivators are seeing how somebody else has dealt with something similar. I think creating those opportunities for them to see models, creating opportunities for them to express their creativity in other contexts. And then think about like how can we still do what you can, do your best in this educational environment and still maintain your creativity simultaneously. And that's easier said than done, and there's no prescription for doing that. Um, But I think having that conversation is really valuable so that they don't feel like, I can never do this, or I'm not, I guess I'm not creative, I'm just gonna give it up. I think it's just more about realizing, as Robert Sternberg says, creativity is a choice. So when do you choose to be creative? And I think the more you choose to be creative, I mean, this is still his line of thinking as well, um, then you can start developing the habit of being creative, which I think is a really beautiful thing for us to aspire to. Thank you so much. All right. I hope that was helpful. It was fun for me. I mean, professors like to profess. I, I really don't think that we as parents, teachers, coaches can expect children to be creative unless we ourselves are willing to take the risk to be creative ourselves. And so I think part of it is reclaiming our own creativity recognizing that we all have creativity and modeling that for youngsters. I think if we really want to nurture creativity, that's probably the most direct path of doing so. Crunchy. Mm -hmm. Savory. Mm -hmm. Oily. Spicy. Slightly. crunchy. <laughs> There's a kind of an underlying almost fish flavor. Uh, sour and kind of herbaceous or earthy. Oceanic of some sort. Okay. You get John? Mm-hmm. Is that correct? And give me Bob? <laughs> Alright, well thanks for sharing. I love I love eating.